everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Natasha Smith and I'm the leader of UAP's global curatorial teams. And I'm Inika Dane. I'm the newest curator to join UAP. And prior to here, I was with Cowder Public Art Projects, as well as independent public art curator, Barbara Flynn. It's great to have so many of you joining us from around the globe. And um, we're speaking to you right now, actually, from our Brisbane studio in Australia. We're delighted to be rounding off our working year with our favourite best of annual review, public art, and this, of course, for 2018. I'd like to start by just saying a really big thank you to Artsy, who have actually been supporting us and have already shared this content. Artsy are the leading global platform for discovering and collecting art, and they published our list late last week and shared it with their 1.4 million subscribers, and we hope some of those subscribers are joining us right now, and if you are, thanks very much. Inika and I have the pleasure today of walking you through what we believe is a very exciting and possibly quite surprising list. Um, we've produced this list through nominations by five esteemed contributing international curators in collaboration with UAP's own curatorial team. We will be presenting the list in conjunction with each of the curators who've nominated the projects and we'll finish, of course, with UAP's own nominations, last but by no means least. Just to clarify, we did have one qualifier that we gave to our contributing curators uh, in the development of this list, and that was that the works had to, of course, be publicly accessible, but there were no other limitations. It really was just a case of tell us what you loved from the past year and why. Okay, so without further ado, here we go. Let's dive on into the very best of 2018. Thanks, Natasha. It's my pleasure to introduce our first contributor, Emma Enderby, who holds the enviable position as senior curator at The Shed. For those who don't know, The Shed is New York City's newest art house, designed by the preeminent architect studio Dilla Scavidio and Renfro. Although there was a prelude earlier this year, The Shed won't officially open until the 2019 Northern Spring, and I'm sure Emma, who actually previously worked alongside Nicholas Bong with Public Art Fund, has an incredible program planned for this almost origami operating building that's designed to commission, produce, and present art indiscriminately across the disciplines. Emma's first nomination, and our very first project in the lineup, is by Boston-born and Berlin-based artist Dorothy Iannone. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Thanks, Inika. This project, of course, is located along the iconic High Line in New York. It's a large-scale mural installation. It actually consists of a series of figures in the form of the Statue of Liberty. Between them runs the words, I lift my lamp beside the golden door, which, of course, is the title of the work. But this is the final line from Emma Lazura's poem, The New Colossus, which is an ode to freedom promised by immigration to America. This particular um, poem is engraved on a bronze plaque mounted actually inside the Statue of Liberty on Liberty Island. What's interesting about, um, of course, the High Line is the audience it attracts. It actually gets 7.5 million people a year. So no doubt this work has captured uh, many eyes and hearts. Emma said to us that she really loves the work of Dorothy, but that she rarely gets to see it in New York and never in the context of public art. Um, she stated to us that she feels that the work is undeniably fresh, courageous, responsive, and, of course, that it shines a light on the reality of the state of immigration today, which is very poignant. Yeah, I love this work for so many reasons. It's very proudly feminine, and it brings Lady Liberty into 2018 with radical cross-cultural fashion and her bright pop colours and patterns that's complete contemporary and fitting reimagining. It's also a great reminder that public art can be two-dimensional. I think for a long time the term became synonymous with large sculpture and light projections, forgot its early beginnings with works like Daniel Bruhn's striped billboard interventions. Mm, that's so true. So it's a nice point of departure to Emma's next nomination. So Emma also chose the Liverpool Biennale in its complete entirety. <laughs> Key to her decision was that all works were free and open to the public. 
This year's 40 artists were scattered entirely throughout public spaces in Liverpool. It's a title that really stands out for me, which is Beautiful World, Where Are You? It feels like both a cry to the past and a call to the future. The artists came from 22 countries and almost all of them are in some form of political turmoil. For example, Iranian artist Abbas Akhavan's monumental soil work, Variations on a Ghost, which references ancient sculptures destroyed by ISIS. And you can see them on the screen just now. I mean, I can't help thinking, thank God for art in these times. It's incredible that this Biennale could speak simultaneous to the legal mechanics of Brexit being motioned in the very same country. And on a less serious note altogether, I thought it was worth mentioning that the inaugural Krabi Biennale this year in Thailand, with the title Edge of the Wonderland, was staged completely outdoors, emphasising the entire environment or geography of the place as a gallery for art. Yeah, it certainly excited us to see a nomination for an, an entire Biennale. Um, exciting but very fitting. And, of course, as you mentioned, this um, Biennale in Thailand as well, being outdoor, you know, it bodes well for public art. I think it's going to be exciting to see what other works we see next year. Now, moving from, I guess you could say, the environmentally conscious um, to something a little bit more consumer-driven, let me introduce you to our next curator um, and contributor, Alison Kugler, and some of her intriguing selections. Alison uh, recently became editor of Vault Art and Culture magazine. She's an independent curator and she has a focus on the nexus of art and fashion. Uh, she co-authored Art and Fashion in the 21st Century, which was published by the fabulous Thames and Hudson. And she recently became a member of the Council of the National Gallery of Australia. Alison's first nomination is a work by Austrian artist Irvin Verm. I have to admit I gasped when I first saw Verm's hot dog bus, <laughs> but on a more serious note, it's a completely astute commentary on gluttony and greed, excoriating as Alison describes. Mm -hmm. She said, I love the idea that the viewer, viewer is both a willing and guilty participant in the act of consumption. The stats say around 50,000 all beef hot dogs were given out in Brooklyn Bridge Park this summer as part of the Public Art Fund program. And it's something about this inclusivity that Alison says embodies the notion of just what public art should be. Mm. I really love this work. It kind of draws me in, but it also pushes me away at the same time. I really do want to eat one of those hot dogs. Um, but I'm also sort of, you know, feeling that sense of guilty pleasure, which um, is kind of personified by this voluptuous and, and also gaudy van. Um, now, just to keep you guys on your toes, we're going to move from the sort of tantalising and provocative to perhaps the more thoughtful. Um, and this is Alison's second nomination, and uh, we're changing gears a bit here for our fourth project on the list by Korean artist Do Ho Su, entitled Bridging Home. This was installed along a pedestrian bridge in London, um, and it's actually a replica of a traditional Korean home. The project really reflects the artist's own experience of moving across continents and between cultures, and it continues his own career-long investigation of memory, migration, and, you know, the multiplicity of the immigrant experience. Um, surprisingly, this is Doho Su's first outdoor public installation. You know, he's such a prolific artist, so we thought that was really interesting. Um, Alison described the work to us as deeply clever. She went on to say that it's incongruous and charming and that it so perfectly illustrates the nuance of what defines home as seen from, I guess, the perspective of an immigrant, which in light of the world's larger issues surrounding the worldwide refugee crisis is very timely indeed. Mm, this is one of a few projects that made our list that talks about migration. And I think that art is the perfect vehicle to express an understanding or bridge an awareness to one of the most pressing issues of our time in non-didactic ways. For example, this very work, um, there's some instinctual emotive gut feeling stirred that transcends language or everyday barriers like race, culture or age. Inter interestingly, also, all of the artists that made this list we're chatting about today um, live and work in different cities, if not countries, to where they were born. Interesting. 
And so from these great juxtaposed works from Kubler, we move to our Australian contemporary, Alexei Glass-Canter, who put forward Rupert Turbanija's untitled The Infinite Dimensions of Smallness and Callum Morton's Monument Number 32, Helter Shelter. Alexei is Executive Director of Artspace in Sydney, one of the country's most progressive spaces for stretching the existing paradigms in the arts. She's also curated over 100 exhibitions across Asia, Europe, North America, and currently has a post until 2020, curating the encounters sector at Art Basel Hong Kong. So Rokrit Turbanija's Untitled was this year's rooftop garden commission at the National Gallery of Singapore. And as you can see, it's a four meter high bamboo maze with a traditional wooden tea house at its center. I wanted to read part of Alexi's nomination here because it's so apt. She says, this site specific installation references both the city's regional specificity and status as an international hub. Situated in central Singapore and framing the urban skyline, Terebanija's large scale bamboo structure acts as a porous labyrinthine border between its public surrounds and the intimate rituals of a Japanese tea house nestled in its center. What the artist describes as the infinite dimensions of smallness has a vast poetic and reflective quality that draws the audience into an enigmatic entanglement of space elegantly dislodged from the everyday. What's also interesting, I think, is the currency of bamboo today because it typifies resourcefulness, sustainability, and the kind of temporary architecture called for where communities are affected by climate change events or extreme weather or nuclear disasters. Mm -hmm. And it also has a currency in the blurring of the lines between art and architecture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. And it really is just such a gorgeous, gorgeous work. Um, so I guess from the deftly subtle to the deftly bold, we have Alexi's next nomination. Um, we've just got one little question that's coming. I'm just going to have a quick read of this. Bear with me. Ah, oh, can you please repeat the name of the artwork and the artist around the tea house piece? Yes, thank you so much for that question. We absolutely can. We can go back up to yeah, the we can title just... slide, which is Rikrit Tiravanija, untitled The Infinite Dimensions of Smallness. We'll just step that back up for you in case you want to just jot that down because it is very difficult to say and spell. So there we are. We'll just pause on that for a moment. Thanks to our listener for that question. No problem at all. Okay, you can all, uh, we'll be publishing this online also mm. um, for everyone to revisit. All right, jumping down, as I said, from the, the deftly subtle now to the deftly bold with Alexi's next nomination, which is um, by Callum Morton, Australian artist, and the work is entitled Monument Number 32, How to Shelter. This is a piece of temporary minor architecture akin in scale to like a bus shelter or even a parade float, you might say. Um, half of the shelter bears, of course, the unmistakable characteristics of Donald Trump rising out of the ground and the other forms a space for seating and some sort of cover from the weather. The work was situated in the Barangaroo development in Sydney. Um, it's interestingly made of painted polystyrene which was carved by a robot using a computer-generated model from um, which derived from the countless images that are available, of course, of Trump's head around in the media. Um, when asked about the work himself, the artist who you can actually see on screen right now sitting inside the work, said that I'm sure people will be appalled and think it's gross, whilst others will engage with it. Um, but he said that's why I make art in the public realm, you have to negotiate complex forces and have conversations that you wouldn't usually have. I think that's a fantastic artist um, quote from the public sort of space. And then um, this quote from Alexi, who of course contributed the nomination, I think is fabulous. She says, the Frankenstein mix of theme park homage and minor architecture highlights that Morton is a deft hand at dark humour and this work plays with form and dysfunction. The front 
is a Bavaria of portraiture, whilst the reverse is a hollowed out shelter of sorts, offering very little reprieve from the current maelstrom of global politics. Ultimately, what lies within is anyone's guess. <laughs> I mean, I think this is a brilliant work full of cutting political commentary. Mm. What leaps out to me is that Morton has deprived Trump of a mouth <laughs> and that when it rained, as shown in some of the images, the effect was that the head was literally drowning or sinking there on the edge of Sydney Harbour. Um, Held to Shelter has just been uh, last week installed down the road from us, actually, at Hota on the Gold Coast. Mm. So it's in a parkland again and very close proximity to water and it'll be there until the 25th of January next year. I think we're all dying to uh, get a look at that one. Um, now, I'm going to just say that we're moving from perhaps the shocking uh, to a little more sobering um, with the fabulous Natalie King's nominations. So Natalie is our fourth contributing curator. Uh, she's actually currently editing a series of monographs um, with Thames and Hudson's and co-curating an exhibition at the Museum of Photography in Tokyo as part of the 2020 Olympics Cultural Program. Natalie was curator, of course, of Tracy Moffat, My Horizon at the 57th Venice Biennale and editor of the accompanying publication also with the fabulous Tens and Hudson. Um, and Natalie has, of course, curated numerous projects all over the world. Her first nomination um, and our seventh project is by the deceased Australian artist David McDiarmid. These are the first works by the artist that have actually been exhibited since his death from AIDS in 1995. The work was commissioned by way of a collaboration with Studio Voltaire and Art on the Underground in London, of course. These works present a selection of David's rainbow aphorism deta uh, digital artworks created between 1993 and 1995, and we see them here um, throughout London and throughout the, Lon the underground. Natalie described to us um, that she felt that these works were witty, and dazzling and had pithy phrases such as don't forget to remember and I'm too sexy for my T cells. She loved that these were emblazoned against these kind of rainbow backgrounds and that they reminded us both of the AIDS crisis and the pertinence of inclusivity in contemporary society. Uh, Eleanor Pinfield, head of Art in the Underground, also said that she felt that this message was brought to new audiences across London and that it challenged some of the more familiar messaging around HIV and AIDS, which really you know, stood out to us as well. Mm, I think the key here is Natalie's comment about the pertinence of inclusivity in mm. contemporary society. It feels like as soon as some human rights ground is broken in one part of the world, some oxygen is cut off in, the, in another. And I think it's interesting Natalie included this project because it really captures just how temporary art can be. It's quite genius because posters are quick, effective, low cost and get the message out there. Mm -hmm. So the medium hand gives complete power to the people and it makes public space everyone's. And <laughs> on power, Natalie's next project is by an Australian artist looking at the symbolic power of flags. So Camilla Ray artist Archie Moore's United Nations, I first saw carriage works for the National New Australian Art, and I'm pretty thrilled it's found a permanent home as a large iteration in Sydney's International Airport. The work is 28 imagined flags representing original Aboriginal nations suspended in an atrium-like space 17 metres above the ground. It's such a strong visual message for both visitors and locals the iconography of the flag is completely territorial and it's a lingua franca across the globe. Mm -hmm. Archie is only just really hinting here at the more than 280 language groups that lived across Australia before colonisation began a systemised campaign to make the majority of these groups obsolete or extinct. For Australia, who's really only today beginning to come to terms with its history, the selection of Archie's work for this commission is a huge step in the right direction, not just in the arts, but across society. 
Yeah, we thought it was very exciting to see a First Nations work um, nominated and particularly such a significant one in a significant public space, you know, an airport in Australia, airports being places of entry and exit, but, you know, representing destination as well and a place for tourists, visitors and locals alike. We see this as a great platform for education um, to not only inspire and educate our local um, residents but also visitors to our shores. It's truly such an opportune and fitting mm -hmm. site for this work. So our final invited contributions come from the formidable Nicholas Bohm, who's been both director and chief curator of New York's Public Art Fund for almost a decade now. Nicholas and I actually share a teeny tiny history yeah. as we've both begun our career in the arts with Calder Public Art Projects, although at different times. It was John Cowdor who brought Christo and Jean Claude to Australia 49 years ago to wrap a large piece of the Sydney coastline, which is a nice legacy of the history of public art in Australia. Memorably, Nicholas curated Ai Weiwei's Good Fences Make Good Neighbours, a citywide exhibition that UAP helped to realise through our New York studio. So Nicholas has put forward an outdoor performance piece for his first nomination, the High Line's Mile Long Opera. The Mile Long Opera was co-created by architects Dilla Scofio and Renfro and also Pulitzer Prize winning composer David Lang with words and lyrics by acclaimed poets Anne Carson and Claudia Rankin. The work is actually a biography of Seven O'Clock at Night. It's ambitious, it's collective, it's free, and it's a choral work. And it shares personal stories from hundreds of New Yorkers about, I guess, life in a rapidly changing city. It actually brought together 1,000 singers across New York for free performances on the High Line, and it occurred over six days. Um, performers came from a range of community choirs across five boroughs. And um, the singers were almost entirely unamplified, which is amazing. Um, they had to each stay in place for three hours a night along the six nights. And for logistical reasons, the work wasn't actually seen or heard in its entirety until the first performance, which is kind of fabulous and amazing. Um, the poets who wrote the text were inspired by real life stories and they gathered these through first-hand interviews with residents, just simply asking the question, what does 7pm mean to you? And as Nicholas so aptly states um, when he sent this to us, it is no easy feat to create a work of art that is at once epic and intimate. <laughs> Yeah, I love the experimental nature and risks taken for this work. It clearly paid off. Uh, no two people could have experienced the same performance. It's a challenge to an age obsessed with digital archiving and fear of missing out, or FOMO as it's usually <laughs> termed. I also think there's something almost heartbreakingly beautiful about the universality and simplicity of such a proposition as a biography of seven o'clock, denoting a common denom denominator around um, just hazarding a guess, dinner, or domesticity and routine. Mm -hmm. So from such a fluid project, the next nomination has sometimes been described as innate but resoundingly monumental. It would be very hard not to include the latest project of Christo and Jean-Claude, the London Mastella, which was a vision of 7,506 horizontally stacked oil barrels painted in hues of sunset and sky on a floating platform in Hyde Park's Serpentine Lake. This was actually Christo's first project in the UK. So the work was a complete monolith, 20 metres high, 30 metres wide and 40 metres long, and it covered in the end approximately 1% of the surface area of the lake. Nicholas made the great connection that oil barrels were among the first objects Christo wrapped or stacked as a young immigre artist in Paris in the late 1950s, culminating in his wall of barrels, Iron Curtain, in 1962. Obviously, between then and now, geopolitics and resource wars have changed the shape of the world dramatically. And Nicholas goes on to state, it was astonishing to see the same functional industrial objects so utterly transformed in use 
from the politically inflected urban barrier of 1962 to the massive and archetypal mastiff form made seemingly weightless on water, dazzling in tones of bright candy. It's been described as an ode to joy, but it almost also reads as chaos abandon as well. It's really interesting to note actually with um, Christo and Jean Claude that they actually self fund their projects through the sale of gallery works mm -hmm. and also, of course, through fundraising and other philanthropic means. But by doing this, they actually retain create, uh, creative control of, of all of their projects, which mm -hmm. is quite fascinating. Um, and they also always ensure that their works are free to the public quite an amazing feat um, through so many incredible commissions. And so now we travel from one amazing waterborne artwork to another with UAP's first nomination by Inika and myself. Um, so here we have Flow Separation, and this is by Torba Albrecht, and it's a transformational work. It combines dazzle camouflage technique, which was invented actually by a British painter, Norman Wilkinson, during World War I, uh, to confuse enemy submarines. And it combines that with fluid dynamics and forms that are found in the wake, wake patterns left behind as objects move through water. Just a couple of interesting facts about this work. Um, it actually, of course, required a very large crew to paint the boat, but that was done uh, alongside the artist by hand at Staten Island Shipyard. The boat itself, the canvas of the piece, it had a historical role in actually evacuating people from Lower Manhattan um, during 9-11 and is a bit of a, a favourite um, of the harbour in New York. Um, the concept itself, for me, really intertwines ideas of engagement, interactivity, op art, technology, innovation, but also, you know, it acts, I guess, as a homage to uh, the end of the World War I and the celebration of peace ultimately. And it's unexpected, it's memorable and highly, highly accessible and just a bit of visual fun, which I think we all need in our lives sometimes. <laughs> and I really love the idea of, you know, being able to see this piece out in the water, moving around, kind of a bit of a change from the rhythm um, and the vibe of the kind of um, busy city life. That's right, I completely agree. <laughs> I also wanted to propose a project that could act in a way as the antithesis of this. I was drawn to Adrian Villarojas from the series Brick Farm, in part because it commands the astute observance of a non-mythologist only in an urban scape. Created for the inaugural Riga Vietnam, Riboka One, this year in Latvia, Villa Rojas continued his imagining a world beyond humans with his work. Installed across the city in trees, building, facades, posts, and other alien foundations were the adobe style nests of Cornero birds collected after being abandoned and then strengthened with saliva, straw, and mud in Villa Rojas' experimental studio that shares a traditional brickyard on the outskirts of Rosario. The Onero bird is renowned for its architectural ingenuity and for the sim similarity between its nests and the shape of mud ovens once essential for subsistence survival across South America. And it's for this reason it became a national emblem in Argentina. In a way, this is a timely reminder that we once respected and learnt from the natural world, whereas now we look to technology, social media and strangers for wisdom. Mm -hmm. It becomes very apparent that with Ernest, Villa Rojas elevates the architectural resourcefulness of this theanthropic alien species and diffuses the hierarchy of humans. And I think shuffling the hierarchies in this way removes the assumed centrality of human intelligence and is a provocation for a more equalised world order, at the same time conjuring the imagery of post-disaster sites such as Pompeii, Chernobyl and Fukushima, where nature reclaims. As a master philosopher on the future, Villa Rojas highlights what is yet to come and what will continue when we're no longer here to create at the same time provoking definitions of art and whether such parameters matter at all given the current world order. Mm. And I think it's just interesting to note as we're flicking through those slides, you might have seen the earlier things and wondered, what am I looking at? But, you know, it really does take the eyes of a sort of bird watcher to find those little forms. Mm. You can see top right there and that image just 
precariously perched on the top of that brick wall is is the nest and then hiding tucked into one of the window frames there um, as you go through they're kind of you know obviously this is cropped to help you see it a lot more but they are these very discreet subtle interventions which is gorgeous mm, that's right. and so I guess we now segue from the minute to the mega uh, from sculpture to architecture but keeping inspiration still really close to nature there's definitely a correlation here as we move to Lafa Eliason's Fjorden House this work is a fortress like office in the Vjallford in Denmark and it was created to be the headquarters of Kirk Capital which is the holding and investment company for three brothers who are actually direct descendants of the founder of Lego. It is the first building to be architecturally designed by Studio Olaf Eliason, which is quite an achievement. Fjorden House stands in the water itself and its geometric form is made of four intersecting circles. Each of these cylinders has voids carved out of them. Um, they're circular at one end and elliptical at the other. It was actually envisaged that the building would become kind of a plaza and a destination um, on the public promenade from the city centre in the fjord, so drawing people out to nature. And the brothers said that they really wanted to give something back to the city. So the building is, of course, a work of art in its own right from the exterior, but also has an entirely accessible public ground floor, which is beautiful. Mm, I think this is such a great moment. It's usually the architect that becomes the artist and not the other way around. And certainly some of the views carved out by the building are reminiscent of a James Turrell sky view or mm -hmm. similar, as you say, a heroing nature. Beautiful. So that actually concludes our dynamic selection. We had 13 projects there all up. It was a little bit of a roller coaster ride through very diverse and I think quite blurred mediums, boundaries, scales, locations, forms, and concepts. But this is our 2018 list of the best public artworks. Um, just to wrap up, I guess, you know, you can see a bit of a summary there on the screen in front of you. It is it is quite hard to define a noteworthy trend or theme amongst this eclectic collection, um, outside, of course, some of the more commonplace themes which we expect to see in excellent contemporary public art, such as, of course, you know, political commentary, community engagement, social engagement, um, place connection and making, et cetera, et cetera. But if we were asked the question, is there a trend? <laughs> we would challenge that the trend for public art in 2018 is that there is no trend, which feels rather unprofound to say, but at the same time, it's intensely liberating mm -hmm. in the moment that we live in. Yes. So now we just wanted to answer a few of those fabulous questions that have come in. So um, first up, we have a question from James. Thanks, James, for asking this. He said that he's noticed that we don't have many women in our lineup. Um, that is entirely correct, James. We actually only have two women out of 13 artists, which is quite shocking. Um, this is something that we actually have been very aware of. Um, and just in terms of the process, I think it's worth noting that this was quite a democratic um, process and, and not at all controlled. We we went out to our contributing curators, our five curators, and we said, let us know your favourites. Um, they didn't know each other's nominations. We actually had no crossover, mm. which was quite fabulous. Um, so, you know, very democratic in that sense and not intentional to um, include or preclude in any way specifically. But what is interesting is out of our five contributors, of course, we have four women. So perhaps we have underrepresented on the artists but overrepresented on the curators, which is quite lovely. Did you want to yeah. add something? Yeah, as um, Natasha mentioned, if you look at the contributors there, are four out of five um, women plus ourselves, of course. Um, one actually expressed great regret with the benefit mm -hmm. of hindsight she didn't choose a public artwork executed by a female mm -hmm. artist but I think in a way it also reflects the commissioning body's decisions and it's a lot more systemic than um, getting to the point that we're at now but it's something that artistic director Mami Kateoka and of course um, curator in her own right was really vocal about and placed continually on her agenda for the most recent 
in Ani mm. of Sydney. I, um, I remember going to quite a few of her talks and she was constantly advocating how to um, go about turning the proportions on its head and to include um, the correct number of women and Indigenous artists, actually. So it's something we could all, for sure, be turning our minds to. It's food for thought. And, you know, we were jokingly saying earlier, actually, because this was on our minds that, you know, perhaps next year it should be a, a review of the best public art by women. So mm. stay tuned. You never know <laughs> what we might do next year. Um, now, second, we have a question from an anonymous, um, and this query is, if you could choose your favourite work from this selection, what would it be? Um, well, I mean, that's a hard question because it's easy just to answer with your own nomination, of course. Um, but I'm going to step outside myself and um, I'm going to say that my favourite was actually something that Nicholas Bone put forward for us with the Ma Long Opera. Um, there's something just pure and ephemeral about something like that which would be so incredibly exhilarating to experience and could only be experienced in the flesh and when I read you know Nicholas's commentary that he sent us he made it sound so beautiful and I just wish that I could have experienced mm. that piece myself mm. um, and I think there's just something incredibly you know amazing about choreographing something at that scale and pulling it off so well. Mm. Yeah it's such a beautiful project I also wish I could have seen it. Um, gosh, <laughs> for me, it's a toss up between Adrian Villarojas from the series Become and Dorothy Iannone's mm -hmm. I Lift My Lamp. Um, I would say Adrian's for his destroying linearities of time yeah. and spaces and things, um, and probably um, Dorothy's for its clear defiance. Yeah, absolutely. And we might just have time for a couple more. So we've got another interesting one here uh, from CJ Anderson. CJ, thank you. What themes do you see emerging in 2019 and beyond? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, of course, for us this year, we, we've kind of made the claim that the trend is there is no trend. But, you know, within that, I think the thing that really stood out to us, and we did reference it and kind of allude to it, is this blurring of, you know, whether it be practice, whether it be medium, you know, we're seeing the uh, artist as the architect. Mm -hmm. We're seeing, you know, um, uh, music combining with um, physical sculpture, combining with live performance. You know, I think we're not having direct definitions per se of the artist saying I want to be known as even an artist, you know, I think we're using that word creative a lot more in, in our everyday as curators at the moment. So I think the blurring is an interesting space. Mm. I'd be um, interested, I think, to see next year in our line up more uh, computer-generated mm. digital art in the public sphere. I think um, I think the parameters uh, are just being fleshed out and it's a very still young, young yeah. um, in inverted commas, I suppose, medium. But, um, but I think uh, before we know it, um, VR in the public sphere and, um, and kind of sculptures, I'm just thinking of Sculpture Munster last year in Germany, one of the sculptures was actually uh, reading a QR code with your phone and then uh, watching the digital sculpture on your phone. Yeah. So I think that I think artists are testing the boundaries of new technologies, the latest technologies, and I think before we know it, we will be including that in our realm of public art thinking. Certainly. I mean, it's certainly um, advanced technology, something that we are hugely um, in favour of at UAP. We have a couple of pretty dynamic robots now. We even uh, see pattern makers working on the floor using augmented reality and VR, mm. so it's, it's pretty exciting. Mm. Um, okay, we've got another question here from Darren. Thank you so much. What is the most ambitious, unrealised artwork in Australia that you would have loved to have seen delivered? Oh, my goodness, that is a loaded question. <laughs> If only they came across our desks more often, that unrealized. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my gosh. 
I mean, we've worked with so many fabulous artists on concepts this year. You know, I'm going to take that one away, Darren, and I'm going to give a good think, and I'm actually going to send you a personal note back on that one because I think we've got some pretty amazing unrealized concepts that we've seen across our desks that yeah. would be fabulous to kind of tell you a little bit more about um, as long as they're not embargoed by confidentiality, but there's got to be something we can share. So thank you. That is an amazing question. Really, really interesting. Um, and I think we're going to make this our last question, but of course we are going to answer everybody that we can on email. So this is coming from Monica. Thanks, Monica, for asking. I have a problem with Archie Moore's airport site. It feels like the site degrades the work, which is obviously of special and spiritual significance. I'd love to hear the artist's thoughts read this, unless you girls know. Look, I don't think we could answer for the artist, of course. I mean, it would be easy if they're in the room with us, but um, mm -hmm. I think as a curator, though, we can probably give some thoughts um, and, and and let you know what we think. And, and you never know, Archie might even react if, uh, if, the, if he's listening today. Um, mm. But I think it's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, public space is always difficult, you know, to exhibit it in the first place. It's not like the gallery. You don't have the benefit of the white walls. You've got a lot of noise. You've got a lot of energy. You've got a lot of activity. And sometimes that noise is beautiful and um, you know, but I think that's kind of the beauty of why we put art in public space because mm. it's democratic, mm. because it's accessible, it's engaging. And in a way, I actually believe as a curator that great public art has to work a lot harder because it has to be able to stand strong mm. in that noisy space and um, leap out. And I think Archie's work does that. You know, it's incredibly beautiful. In some ways it does talk to sight very literally in the sense that it's kind of floating and it's in the air and it's sort of talking to ideas of movement on the wind and aviation. But in other ways it also acts as a really great, you know, signifier or kind of symbol of, of place, of destination, of arrival, um, of getting to know the land upon which you're about to enter. Mm. You know, I guess a kind of not but a nod to a welcome to country in a way. It's yeah. Kind of interesting. Yeah, I agree. And I guess the first thing um, to remember is that these flags are imagined by Archie. And um, I mean, he is a great provocateur in many ways. And and perhaps, perhaps the provocation of discussion about um, Indigenous First Nations in Australia um, generated by their placement um, the, the kind of the education component mm -hmm. of that could outweigh um, kind of competing, mm -hmm. competing um, issues that arise with the work, perhaps. Yeah. But for sure, we could get back to you on that. I mean, Archie is a local artist here in Brisbane, and I'm sure he'd be happy to be engaged in that conversation. Yeah, definitely. Well, guys, thank you so much. They were really interesting questions, and we hope that you've been as excited as we have been and are surprised um, by the roundup. We love doing this um, best of and we'll be back again next year to do the same. So be sure to tune back in. So thanks again from myself, Natasha. And thank you from Erica. <laughs> Have a fabulous time. Bye. Bye.